Listening to the GHT Overland Podcast. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us on the GHT Overland Podcast. This is where you get the greatest interviews and insights from overland travelers around the globe. You will learn the basics to the advanced in overlanding, so buckle up and get ready for more adventure. I'm Chris. And I'm Lisa. This is part two with Lee and Steph of Grizzly and Bear. Last week, we learned a little on border crossings with a drone, car insurance for overland travelers, a super sweet clothesline, and of course, much more. This week, you'll want to buckle up as we cover border crossings, tips on crossing from Armenia to Azerbaijan, finances, Navigation and all the finer details of the Grizzly and Bear setup with Lee and Steph. That is right, and I think we are ready to jump into this one, Lisa. What do you say? I still can't believe they got arrested. (laughs) I know. Tough crowd over in Azerbaijan. Talk about enter with caution. Whew. Carry extra stickers, people. Border crossings, what tips do you have for preparing for them? <laughs> you can never be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's border crossing are really, uh, it can, sometimes it can take 10 minutes or sometimes it can take a few hours. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, a tip for me would be to be quite relaxed and not mm-hmm. stressing. We've got nothing to yeah. To hide, we've That's got right. nothing. So just uh, be prepared that it might take a long time. So don't go to a border, cro- a border crossing at 6 p.m., say, for example. just We try to do them fresh early in the morning. We often camp um, as close to the border as we can and then do the border crossing early morning. Yeah, and- we have no time limit, so... That's a good point. If, you, if you're going to, you know, you've been driving all day, I think your attitude, your personal attitude can make all the difference uh, in a border crossing in a foreign country. You, if you arrive, you've been driving 500 kilometers that day, you're tired, you're a bit frustrated already, then that's going to that's gonna show, you know, and, and they've got all the time in the world. They're not going to give you any breaks, you know what I mean? They've got their job to do. They treat everybody the same. So like Stephanie said, if we're, if we're running a bit late, we don't care. We'll just camp out near the border and do it nice and fresh in the morning. I think it's important also to uh, – it can be quite nerve-wracking sometimes, I guess, but to be confident um, and not be intimidated as well. You know, be be openly honest when you get to the border. Have all of your documents ready, everything in the car. You don't want to be looking for stuff last minute. Do your research beforehand too. You know, know what you're going to need. Know what they're going to ask for. And, uh, yeah, be as prepared as you can, but also be ready for the unexpected. Very good. Any specific border crossings that uh, that stand out to you? Uh, yes. So one time, um, and we collect the little overlanders uh, flag of all the countries we've been to, and there is a really big uh, – they're still at war between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, and the Azerbaijan go- uh, border guide he saw the sticker of armenia and he was really really offended and he asked us he saw a, a knife on the in the car and he asked us to scrape the sticker with the knife yeah and we that we one did, stands out we had yeah. an adventurous time in azerbaijan anyway but it all sort of started there with him you know something so small oh, that boy. we didn't yeah. 
yeah, we'd, we'd done our research. We knew about the ongoing hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But, you know, we had our the little teeny stickers, little every country's flag sticker, as a lot of overlanders do. You know, we collect the stickers on the side of our car. We actually had them on the camper. And this guy he just spotted this little tiny Armenian flag sticker and he was so angry and offended by us having this sticker on the car. So, you know, it's something we were ready. We, we were already we had our answers ready for all the questions. We knew they were going to ask us about Armenia because we would traveled in Armenia. Uh, but we were not prepared for that. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden we had a guy who was offended at us and angry at us because of a little sticker on the side of a car. So you, you just never know what to expect. He actually wanted us to, like Steph said, scrape it off with a knife. Um, but we ended up convincing him that if we just stuck another sticker over the top of it temporarily, maybe he wouldn't be so angry and they, they let us go through. But, you know, <laughs> it's little, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, something so small that could have just turned into a bit of a situation, you it's know. A sticker. Yeah. A sticker, <laughs> yeah. And later on during that trip, uh, we tried to maybe make a long story short, but <laughs> we actually got arrested by the um, Azerbaijan police and they thought we were Armenian spies, so we went and spent oh, a day at that. the police station. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So that was quite – Turned into a, a bit of an so adventure. Out of it, I mean, quite an adventure. It certainly yeah. was, yeah. It was a life-changing experience, but, you know, all's well that ends well. We, we got out of there and we don't hold anything yeah. against them. They were just doing their job and – and I think of... also because the car is like the green, um, military green, and <laughs> quite, it's a big truck, as you say in America, you call yeah. it a truck and not a car. Uh, it's 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 a big truck, and the color and that they saw maybe we were some military. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what things escalated quite quickly, I guess. But it, yeah. actually, what it was was um, was the dash camera. We have a dash camera in our car. And we didn't know at the time, but the national park that we entered and drove through was actually, I mean, we knew it was very close to the hostility region, to the disputed border zone between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And as we drove through, we passed through several um, military bases. Um, Yeah, they'd actually noticed the, the dash camera as we drove through, and they thought we were driving through their military bases, through the national park, uh, taking recording footage for the Armenian military, which <laughs> obviously was a huge misunderstanding wow. and wasn't yeah. true. I mean, we know we knew already that dash cameras, you have to be careful with them. We actually carry with us a little black cotton sack that as we cross borders, we, we cover the dash camera. We put a little black sack over the dash camera so that to avoid any discrepancy or anything later, because okay. it, it's a sensitive area, you know, you're in a, a regulated area, you're going between countries, you're you, so we, we just do it anyway. We I read somewhere many, many, many years ago that it's a good thing to do. Otherwise, we heard of people having to remove the SIM card, uh, sorry, the, the SD card from the camera, showing them what's on it, you know, making sure there's nothing there. Um, so, yeah, it's just something we do. But we were driving through a national park at the time. We weren't prepared to be entering all these military secluded zones. And, and so that's all it was, you know, another little slip up from our part. But completely uh, innocent and unintentional but again escalated quite quickly <laughs> yeah i got a little more excitement out of that one i would have never thought about oh yeah that's that. for yeah. sure no do your research to, know yeah. what you're doing that's right yep yeah, exactly <laughs> any additional specific safety planning you do or tips you can provide our listeners on the safety and security what do you reckon Steffi? no i mean to me, the world is a safer place than what we yeah. can think of. For sure. I think you've, um, like we said before, do do your research. I mean, you, you're not going to travel blindly through through any country in the world, and, and that's including my own country. I mean, any any country, we make no differences between all the countries we travel, but be aware. Do a little bit of research. Um, you know, know about the political situation in, in a country you're about to travel to. Do a little bit of research into what's culturally acceptable. You know, for example, we we never traveled to Iran this time, but we knew if we went to Iran, it's it's different rules there. Steph was going to have to wear a headscarf. You know, don't don't accidentally do something that's going to offend people, um, and then you know get in trouble. Do, try your best. You know, you can only do your best. You can still end up in tricky situations like what happened to us, but. Do a little bit of research, know about the political situation, learn about the cultural 
you know, things that, that, that might be different to where you're from and, um, and yeah, just, just do your best, but don't take it too seriously. Always wear a nice smile, you know, say hello to everybody and, and always wear your seatbelt. Always wear your seatbelt. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what saves us. That's true. In a accident. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, smart. It's a simple things. Mm-hmm. How do you guys manage changing currency as you travel into and out of different countries? Uh, we use the card and we go to ATMs and we withdraw some local currency. Mm-hmm. That's what we've been doing most of the time. Uh, on the phone, I also got an app which is called uh, X. E currency, so then you can have all the. Uh, it's uh, off data. You don't need data for this app to work, and uh, you've got all the exchange rates, and you can, um, yeah, do uh, so you know uh, how much it is. <laughs> I think these days the the world is. You can go to the tiniest village in the middle of of nowhere, and they're gonna ha- probably have an ATM that accepts a Visa card. It's. I think maybe traveling as overlanders these days we definitely have it easier than i think the the hardcore overlanders of 20 maybe 30 years ago 40 years ago i mean you can you really can find banks you can find some way to withdraw money at every single border crossing there is uh, exchange places you know so we'll we'll always try to carry a little bit of your currency actually the us dollar seems to be the international currency so you can you can have that anywhere you go and you can if not get it changed you can even pay with it we found in mm-hmm. almost yeah. any country in the world if you've got some us dollar it goes along long a long way so it's never that's been the probably the least thing to that we've had to organize is, is currency it's very easy you can change money anywhere you can find an atm anywhere you might get stung with massive bank yeah, fees yeah. and <laughs> which we do Definitely, a lot but that's part of the budget yeah we we, we have to accept that and yeah. it's part of the budget yeah but it's definitely it's yeah. a very easy thing in today's uh today's sometimes time. remember in uzbekistan oh yeah we did have one time we couldn't find <laughs> it took ATM. us a whole day to try to find money and we didn't find and it we couldn't end. find it in the end but that was only one day in many many years so yeah it's not a big deal <laughs> <laughs> that's great so let's dive deeper on finances one mm-hmm. of the most common questions asked is how can you afford to do what you're doing? Or I'm sure you've gotten the standard, you must have won the lottery or be rich. <laughs> Where obviously yeah. the real question is, how can they do what you're doing? How can our listeners mimic what you've done so they can do something more than a weekend or a week's vacation overland trip? So if you would, give us your best insights on financing and budgeting an overland trip like yours. Not a problem at all. And you're right. It is the most common question. Everybody wants to know that. And it's it's a valid question. I mean, it's, it's I guess, a lot of people's dream to just take off and do it. But uh, I, I am very, very lucky that I work in an industry where I do one month on, one month off. So I work in the offshore industry. I do take a lot of time off of work. So I've, I've just had six months off, but I've recently gone back to work. So when I work, I do month on, month off. When I go to work, Stephanie stays with the car in whatever country we were traveling most recently. I'll go to work for a month. Uh, I'm currently working in China, in northern China. Then when I fly back, we then I, I meet Stephanie wherever we were, and we continue the journey like that. So she's a full-time traveler. I'm six months on the road when I'm not at work. Um, I also would like to uh, say for uh, the traveling, it costs less money than what you think. My biggest uh, concern before uh, starting the trip was the diesel. I was like, how can we, how are we going to afford diesel when um, in Europe you have like, you put gas in your car, it costs like $250 or something like that. But the country we're traveling in, it's way more affordable and you're not driving thousands of kilometers all the time. You know, we go fairly slowly so the diesel is not a a big expense at mm-hmm. the end. The food is really affordable. Uh, we don't have bills. We don't have rent. Um, we don't pay for water. There is always um, fresh water sources. Uh, we produce our own electricity. So really, it's cheaper than that. What? Yeah. Can, what do you think? It's more affordable than yeah. than what people think. But also be. Another piece of advice would be to be, depending on, everybody's got a different budget level, you know, so it's hard to say, but 
keep track of it. I, <laughs> I'm not so good at it, but luckily uh, Stephanie, she is in, I would say she's borderline OCD when oh, it comes totally to our, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> OCD when it, when it to comes to, <laughs> to the bookkeeping. So she's, she's very strict. You know, we, we enjoy ourselves too. We're not, if we, like Stephanie mentioned, we're in countries that are a little bit more affordable and sometimes it is just as cheap to go to a, a local restaurant as yeah, what it is totally. to go and buy at supermarkets and stuff. So we, oh, and you, you, then you're spending a bit and you, you know, you're throwing a bit of money into the, the local economies too by, by mm-hmm. just eating locally and, um, through the restaurants and roadside food and all that sort of stuff. But two dollars, you have a meal. Know what you're spending too. Keep track of it. At the end of each month, Stephanie can look. She's got. Maybe we can send some photos through to you of, of just the basic <laughs> setup, but it's incredible. And people, we've met other overlanders that that are just blown away by the Stephanie's bookkeeping. And it's it's <laughs> like she just said, she can tell you every cent that we've spent on every single little thing for many, many, many years now. So no matter what you're spending, whether you've got a budget or not, um, just know what you're spending it on at the end of each month. And then you can look at it and say, okay, maybe we didn't need to spend so much on that particular, uh, you know, sort of item, maybe this, this, but at least then you've got a, you've got a history then that you and can you look know, back on. You know where the money goes. Yes, yeah. you know where it's going. That's right. Then, then having a couple of thousand dollars gone at the end of the month and thinking, oh, well, where did we spend it? We know what we spent on diesel. We know what we spent on this, this. But at least if you can narrow it all down, it definitely helps you prepare and, and gauge how long you can travel for. That's great. Yeah, that'd be great to see. Nice job, Stephanie. You're very detailed. <laughs> yeah. Love it. I'd have to say you, Stephanie, and I are a lot alike in that aspect of yeah, always Yeah, because you're the CFO. <laughs> down to the penny. <laughs> I haven't scaled a mountain, but maybe one day. <laughs> ah, maybe one day. When we come to visit, we'll take you next year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So let's switch gears into navigation and communication. Tell us about your communication and any tips from cell phone plans to SIM cards so that you stay connected across the world. So on each country we go to, we get a SIM card and some data, uh, usually maybe 20 20 gig, and it is fairly affordable, um, say $8, I would say, average. $8 $8 for 20 gig, you get a SIM card. You can choose not uh, to have a phone. You just ask for data. Nowadays, it's really easy. I mean, we've been to Georgia, Armenia, uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan. It's always been um, easy. And also for um, – that's a tip that I didn't know before um, – for uploading uh, the YouTube videos. Before I was looking for some free Wi-Fi and the uh, upload speed was uh, really, really low. And I'm like, how how people do that? How they manage to upload videos without being staying in a cafe for five hours? Or um, So what we do, we hotspot the mobile phone into the laptop and then I can upload the videos that way. And it works really good. Yeah. And that doesn't yeah, take commu- up all your data? But no, because like we have, yeah, usually we take 20, 20 gig and one okay. video must be 1.5 usually. Yeah. So it's quite, like Stephanie said, it's quite affordable for the, the communications never been an issue. You can get a SIM card in any country you travel mm, to. Yeah. We'll sometimes get one and we just share it or we'll get one each depending on, on the price of the SIM cards. It's never been an, an issue at all. Um, as far as navigation, that's for me. That's a big one because I, I we get a lot of messages and stuff all the time asking us, "What do you do?" You know, you seem to find yourself on these little roads out in the middle of the mountains in in Georgia or in in Kazakhstan and everything. How do you navigate? And I I just want to stress to everybody that you do not need to spend big money on fancy navigation systems. We've never bought or paid for any navigation system. And I mean, we're driving around the world. We're taking small trails, hiking trails, off-road trails, everywhere. And we only use free apps. We use Maps Me. We use Offline Maps and Navigation and OSMAN Maps and Navigation. And there is actually another one made in the Czech Republic called Mappy. And between all of the different um, navigation apps that are all free, 
uh, you can they're all good for different things, let's say. And between all four of them, you you can play with them. OK, this one doesn't have this road. Let's try the next one, try the next one, try the next one. And you really do not need these fancy systems. You can you can get by with with free apps for navigation. That's really good. And then do you guys use like an in reach or a spot for communication <laughs> if needed in an emergency situation? That's really funny you mentioned that because we actually we just bought an inreach today. Yeah, oh, like very two good. hours ago. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we did run a spot. We had a spot navigation beacon for many many years when we travelled around Australia. We used a spot. Um, I had a few issues with my spot trying to send um, pins from from Morocco recently. Well, not recently. When we were there a year and a half ago. Uh, so I decided to, we didn't have a, an emergency beacon for a little while. I'd done a lot of research and I think come up with the, the fact that the inReach is a fantastic tool because it's two way communication, whereas the spot is only one way communication. So you can send and receive messages to the inReach. So we haven't put it into practice yet, but we'll, uh, we'll set it up and it's, see it's, how it goes. For us, it's important because we, the, because of what we do, we hike, we go rock climbing, so it's uh, it's important for us to have this device. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the two way communication is a game changer. I have had an big, reach big time. for many years. And, ah, okay. Uh, yeah, very very helpful. All right, excellent. Cool. So you, you recommend that one? Yeah, absolutely. And we bought it on special cool. too today. <laughs> yeah, we got a good deal on it today. We actually went to a camping off. store. Was closing down, and there was a special on an in reach. So we said, "All right, that was meant to be." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Very good. Yeah, you like it. So let's go through some onboard necessities real quick. How much fuel can you carry? How far does it take you? And any tips on calculating your fuel needs? Yeah, it's um, we carry, we have a main reservoir of 140 liters and then a, a auxiliary tank of 70. So we carry 210 liters of diesel on board. We, it depends very much on how we drive, but I would say at an average we do 13 litres for 100 kilometres. So that's what we try and average it on, and that's what okay. we, we know we can get. So you can you can work it out quite easily on what you need. But at the same time, a similar thing. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever driven anywhere that's as remote as what it is in Australia. You can always get, you know, work it out and be at the be able to get to the next diesel station without having to carry crazy amounts of, of extra fuel. Okay. And then how much water do you guys carry and any tips you've got on filtering water? Okay. So the camper holds 80 liters and uh, we have a 50 liter tank in the car under the back seat. Uh, we keep those 50 liters for uh, what we know to be drinkable water. So oh, on that tank only goes uh, potable water. Uh, what do we have? We have, uh, what is it called again? I forget. <laughs> um, this thing, no? Ah, the um, <laughs> SteriPen. Yeah, we have a SteriPen, so that will kill the virus. It kills, virus that does everything, virus, virus and, and bacteria. bacteria. But it's an it ultraviolet light uh, water sterilizer. But it doesn't yep. uh, filter. We do have a MSR water filter also yeah. that will do the... MSR does bacteria and sediment, gets you some yeah, fairly sediment. clean water. And if you're not sure about the water after that, then we, we have the little SteriPen, which after we've filtered it through the MSR hand press water filter, then we'll use the ultraviolet light on it and, and hit it with that as well. But but often on the road, uh, they, there are water sources that are for the villages and that's the water that people are using so it's potable water we have we have had access to quite easily during our travel yeah we have tried to sort of i mean we we do use the ultraviolet water filter probably the most if we if we feel we need to but at the same time what we tried to do as we left western europe behind was to I guess, build up our immune system. And we did, without being silly, if we thought the water was a, a pure source and from the mountains, then we started drinking. If the locals were drinking it, we drank it. And there was a couple of times we got sore bellies, but there wasn't anything mm-hmm. anything major, you know. If they're, if they're drinking it, then we figured we could drink it as well. And if we're not mm-hmm. sure, we do sterilize. We recently just bought a, um, which we haven't used yet either, was the, um, the Lifesaver jerry can which is the, it holds 18 litres, I think. And um, 
you can you fill that up. So we're going to try and be a little bit more strict now that we have access to this larger volume water we, filter. And as we go deeper to Asia, also yeah. maybe. Yeah. Okay. And the, do you guys use solar or a generator? Solar. solar. <laughs> and that keeps your laptop going, stuff. Yeah, laptop. Uh, f- uh, fun. We we can charge uh, the laptop also in the car when we drive. Uh, I bought um, the charger. I've got a Mac Air, and I've got a 12 volt charger for it. So that's great, great tool. Um, what do we use the solar for? Where we charge? But what, mainly we charge everything in the car when we drive. Even the mm-hmm. drone batteries, 12 volt charger, the phone, uh, the the Canon camera. Also, uh, I can charge from the, the cigarette car. from cigarette lighter. For us, it's um, we could actually do with a second solar panel. We only have one 160-watt solar panel, and it's pretty much tied up just trying to keep our fridge running. We've got a Dometic uh, fridge-freezer combo that is not – it's not gas. It only runs off, off um, 12-volt power, and uh, we are struggling to keep up a lot of the times. If we have beautiful – blue sky every day which obviously doesn't happen every day then it can keep up but if we get a couple of cloudy days we do fall behind a little bit on the um on the fridge and it and it takes a long time to catch up we've got a cool system in the car where i have a bosch dual battery system in the car and that can run all our auxiliaries so we can charge even if we're not driving for a few days we can still charge everything electronically in the car rather than in the camper and then leave the solar to just try and keep the fridge running um so it's a cool system and when we drive the car the alternator will charge up the auxiliary battery in the car and then if there's any if once that's full it then diverts the power through to the uh double battery system in the camper and will top up the batteries in the camper as well and that works both ways so if we're camped up in nice weather and we're not driving anywhere for a while Then the two batteries in the camper, if they're fully charged from the solar, the solar will then throw power to the auxiliary battery in the car and top that up as well. So that's a um, blue solar Victron system, marine system, which is really, really cool. Nice. Yeah. And then can you give us a little detail um, on the refrigerator? Any tips you've got for our listeners in selecting a refrigerator? What do you reckon? Well, we've got this Dometic one, which is – like, fridge I'm not freezer in love but with it. <laughs> yeah we'd like to well we want to get the late the newer one because with ours it's an old one and you can't we've got the freezer but we don't use the freezer no. so we'd like to have one of the newer ones now that you can switch it off the same model Dometic I can't remember the exact model but it's a smaller one and the newer ones now you can flick a switch and the freezer becomes part of the fridge. We can't do that at the moment. So it's sort of a bit of wasted space. And energy. Yeah, I think and it, energy. It takes a lot of energy mm-hmm. too. And so you find that having a freezer is not something that you need? Not no. so much, no. The fridge for us is just for okay. uh, vegetables, yeah. fresh fresh fruit and vegetables um, that need to be refrigerated. You know, if we're going to – we sort of figure if we want to buy meat, we'll, we'll buy it. On the day. Yeah, and we'll eat it the same day. You know, and we don't – need to have piles of meat frozen in the freezer or and anything we, like that. And we don't eat dairy pretty much. Mm-hmm. So um, we have the black coffee. Um, so, And when it's not so hot, you can keep your vegetables out of the fridge. Yeah. Like, so, uh, yeah. And it's never that remote and we can go shopping um, every four days, three days, yeah. local markets. Yeah. Okay. So that works out uh, yeah. Good. No. No. Yeah. We don't do ice cream. We don't need a freezer. <laughs> there you go. You can buy ice cream at the at the shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. Any specific recovery gear that you use or would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, I would say. <laughs> yeah, the for me a lot. Of, well, for me, I don't recommend a high lift jack. Don't bother with a high lift jack. A lot of people carry these massive high lift jacks around with them. They're heavy. I know you can use them for a lot of different things, but all the stuff you need a, that you can use a high lift jack for, you can do it with other things. So in, in replacement of a high lift jack, we carry an exhaust jack. And that thing um, that thing has saved us a few times in the past, big time. And with an exhaust jack, I think ours is rated to lift four and a half ton and it doesn't weigh 50 kilos or whatever, <laughs> 40 kilos the size yeah. of a high lift jack. 
And other than that, we do have an electric winch on the front um, and all the basic uh, towing straps and, and tow ropes and uh, snatch block and basic recovery gear. We carry also waffle boards rather than um, sand ladders. So, I mean, they are, you know, the thicker plastic style waffle board that's actually rated as well. So they say you can use it as a bridge uh, to get over some deep ruts or something if you needed to. For me, that's a, they're a lot more heavy duty and they don't bend and buckle like your aluminium or your um, or risk of breaking like your plastic waffle boards, in, uh, sorry, the small sand ladders. So I'd have to say that your waffle boards did do you some good in the desert. I watched a clip. Um, ah, a little mini one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it worked great. Um, it did. Uh, that was actually only the min- the little one we used in the in the desert that time. I was I was going through a process of trying to get ourselves out before, like just sort of testing the equipment. We knew we were pretty remote that day. Um, storm was coming. Yeah, there was a big storm coming, and at that stage, I didn't have an electric winch. That was on our first car, and I'd bought a hand winch. Um, so I don't know if you remember the video, but I was winching us out by hand with like a hand pulley and the little waffle board we were using was not, we have full size waffle boards, but though that was just actually the jack stand. So I was just actually, I was a little bit lazy that I couldn't be bothered getting the waffle boards <laughs> out. So I was seeing, seeing if I could get us out first just by using the small one and it worked. So we were, we were good. That's great. So road stories are always a favorite. What's a favorite road story of yours or maybe a situation you were nervous about going into and how did it turn out for you? Because of uh, what we do with the the mountaineering and the rock climbing, we constantly find ourselves in situations that are on the verge of turning into a, a bit of an epic adventure and they're not always, you know, overlanding related sort of thing, but they can be very remote, whether we've hiked into the mountains um whether we're whether we're stuck on the side of a cliff in a storm, and that well, that makes me think of one straight away is we were rock climbing in the Todra Gorge in Morocco, and we started climbing. It was a beautiful blue morning, a uh, blue sky, lovely day, and by the end there was a thunderstorm rolling in, and we actually got caught in a flash flood in the mountains of Morocco in a lightning storm. That was a very hectic, uh, yeah, very, very scary and hectic moment because you're trying to hike out of the mountains completely yeah. exposed, covered in, in metal, you know, all the rock climbing equipment through a lightning storm. So that was, yeah, probably one story that springs to mind straight away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, uh, you'd be hustling out of there. Yeah, oh yeah, we were getting as low as we could very, very fast. So any helping others doing good or philanthropy that you do along your travels? We don't throw things away. We always make sure it goes into good hands and we always make sure it will make someone happy. And we did that uh, several times, uh, starting um, about just after the accident, actually. Uh, we were we carried two push bikes at the back of the camper, and then we realized it's, it's heavy, it's, it's bulky. We don't use it as often as we should. So uh, this man came to tow our car away, and we gave him the two bikes, and it was just before Christmas, and oh, yeah. you should have seen his. Oh, he was the happiest man in the world with those two. He bikes. was crying. Uh, you know, yeah. they were two very good push bikes, and like we we have no qualms, no hesitation whatsoever. If we're not using it, and we think it can go to someone, you know, who's oh. going to use it, or anyone who who can make use of something we're not using, then for sure we're not going to try and make money out of anything as we cruise along. But this, yeah, the emotion on this. It was after the accident too, so this guy had come to collect the wreck of our car in a Portuguese campsite. Um, and yeah, like Steph said, just before Christmas, we gave him these two almost new, well, one was brand new and another one almost new push bike to this Portuguese truck driver and, and just the emotion, you know, he showed us photos of his son and show, oh, the son and the daughter or whoever these push bikes were going to go to. And, and it, it's a really cool feeling. And this, yes. we do it a lot because, I mean, we have yeah, we've got – like uh, we'll we like Stephanie said, we try to declut. We we want the bare minimum on our truck, but you do accumulate stuff, and we do realize we have stuff we probably packed that we don't need. So as we travel, if we think that it can go to someone who's going to make better use of it at us, we we do it a lot, and even sometimes even things that we use, sometimes we yeah, I feel like we met some really amazing people, and I just 
want to give them a little souvenir or a little something. And uh, our last time was uh, Liz Perfume or Cologne, whatever you <laughs> yeah, want to call my it. Cologne. Uh, and this lady, she saw it um, as she was looking inside the camper and uh, we saw her eyes, uh, this lady in Uzbekistan, she was just like, oh, wow, and we just gave it to her and she was really, <laughs> was really great. happy. Yeah, it's a cool yeah. feeling, I think, and to just closing, to do that. And closing also because we travel, we're travel, we traveling through different seasons and sometimes I'm like, oh, this jumper, I might not wear it for, you know, for a long time so it can maybe find a better home. And yeah, yeah that's a little part. And... um yeah, free hug. It's only small things, free but it, it makes you. That's great. It definitely makes you feel feel good, and and you see people are appreciative of of little things, you know. Yep, absolutely. That's mm. those are those are great tips. I've not heard that before, so that's that's super exciting. Yeah. You've got a little bit of something extra, or you've got some clothes yeah. you're not going to wear for another couple months, and somebody exactly. can use them where you're leaving. Yep. Absolutely, one hundred percent. We always offer, you know, we don't feel. We don't want people to think that they're a charity case either, you know what I mean? We just sure. say to them, could you use this? Would you like this? And you see their eyes light up. Yeah, we'd love that, you know. And, um, and yeah, so we, we have no hesitation. So it's yours. Take it, you know. That's good. Good for you guys. So this has been a lot of fun. Anything that we've missed? I think it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been a lot of fun for us as well. So let's wrap it up with some fun facts about you. What keeps your co-driver occupied on long drives? Um, doing my banking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the balancing That's and the true. keeping track of things. Yeah, try to work out on the um, receipt uh, from the from the grocery store and ah, when it's written yes. in Russian, <laughs> try to work what everything is. <laughs> Good luck. Oh, that, and it's quite amusing for me to, me to watch this happening while I'm driving and it Never ceases to amaze me how many hours and hours and hours nah. Stephanie can spend trying to translate receipts from Russian or from Kazakh to to what we spent, like how much a tomato was worth. Or it's uh, it's quite amusing. <laughs> That's great. Do you play any musical instruments on the road or around the campfire at night? Nope. No, pass. No, we're no. definitely not musically talented. I can sing. No, when you I drive. can't. Oh, no. <laughs> What's your favorite drink in the morning to get you going? Oh, definitely the, uh, without a doubt, and one of my most prized possessions is the Italian coffee pot, you know, the, uh, pot. yeah, the mocha pot. Black the, coffee. The black coffee, the steamed pressurized coffee, uh, essential and uses a small amount of gas as well. So it's a good bit of kit. And I like to put a bit of coconut cream in my coffee. Gets you but going. There we go. It's not um, hard to I, find. Yeah, I can't find it anywhere yeah. here. Not not so original, but definitely the coffee first thing in the morning. So what's a favorite beverage at night to wind down after a long day on the road? A little glass of red wine. Yeah. The yeah. what? Uh, Mold- Moldavia? No. Yeah, that was a very nice one. But we've actually found as we don't we don't drink so much, but we'll always have a have a bottle of red wine in the in the camper and a nice glass with dinner is is very relaxing in the evening watching the sunset. And we love to try each country. Every country has wine. It, it, some countries better than others, but uh, at the moment we found that we love the Kazakh, Uzbek, and Kyrgyz wines. They do a semi sweet wine, and it's yeah. fantastic. Just a little glass. Little glass. <laughs> the bottle will last us. Four days, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your best advice to aspiring overlanders like us? Do it. You won't regret it. <laughs> yeah, do it. We um, Someone asked us this question recently, actually, and I think uh, my answer was just to, to – well, you spoke about planning earlier. Plan but have a date to, to do this trip of yours, whether it be a two-week trip or a two-year trip. It doesn't matter. Set a date that cannot be changed – Book that time off work, hand in your notice if that's what it takes. You know, once your budget's in, Lord, if you can do it, set that date that can't be changed because that's the thing that holds a lot of people back, I think, is is changing their mind or getting hesitant at the last minute and being able to change their mind. Make it so you can't change your mind. It's set in stone. You have to go. You're committed um, and, and then you will and you'll never look back. That's great. So how can people learn more about you and what you guys are doing? Oh, so we have a YouTube channel 
called Grizzly and Bear Overland. Uh, we put a video every week, every Friday. Uh, so maybe it's Thursday night for you in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, weekly video. And yeah, it's about the culture, the country we're visiting. Uh, yeah, so I hope people can enjoy this. Check it out. Yeah. Uh, we also um, would like to thank our patron because we've got an account on patron.com. Uh, where people uh, choose to support our work for the videos. And that's uh, fairly recent for us, and it has been such an amazing experience and really, really overwhelming. um, Support. Very, very nice people we've met through uh, Patreon. Yeah. That's awesome. And then can people find you on social media? Yeah, we do the the Facebook thing and the Instagram thing. Same, uh, Same name, Grizzly and Bear Overland. Um, but yeah, the, I guess the Facebook, we don't keep up with as much as we should, but I think Instagram and YouTube is sort of oh, the way the things are focus. going these days. Yeah. Any more information you'd like to give or useful resources that our listeners should check out? All of my research, um, and my resources come through, I mentioned Facebook before. That's what I use Facebook for these days is online forums. You can ask a question on Facebook or or something like that, and you can have so many people with a wealth of knowledge helping you out. So I guess even if you don't like it, if you're using it for your best interest, I think social media is a a fantastic resource and a way to connect and communicate with like-minded people all the way around the world. Thank you so much for your time. We are humbled that you've given us such an amazing look into your world, experiences, and knowledge. Safe travels and adventures to you, and we hope to catch up with you again in the future. Thank Thank you you so so much. much. Thanks for having us. And we hope to see you in America. (laughs) Yeah, we'll see you guys soon. (laughs) Azerbaijan and Armenia stickers. A good heads up to avoid such issues if you are headed that way. That was crazy. And getting arrested for being an Armenian spy? Quite adventuresome. That was crazy. If you've not watched their YouTube uh, um, episode on that, you need to go watch it. It is... Edge of the seat excitement. I... I don't know that they even knew that they were filming. Well, thank God they didn't because they were able to walk out with all that recorded footage. But it was, I guess, a little entertaining. But to me, it was more jaw-dropping. Like, they really think that, they're like, legitimately, they were convinced that Lee and Steph were Armenian spies. Of course, we think that's funny. Looking at it from their point of view, you can probably kind of, I don't know. But it was nuts. Well, partly I think she was right because the green vehicle, kind of military per se look. Yeah, but the Um, camper is definitely not military. No. (laughs) But bless those those guys' hearts for doing their job. So good job, our Azerbaijan military folks. (laughs) But you need to loosen up a little bit about the stickers. Just carry extra with you. That was a great episode. Information on budgeting. Steph is impressive with her bookkeeping. Equally impressive how squared away they are. Balancing Lee's work and overland travel. Yeah, pretty uh, pretty impressive. Um, what else? So we had 10 years of experience. Oh, the big one was navigation. So Lee made a really good point. No, they've been traveling, overland traveling for 10 years. Basically, arguably, full-time. Lee is telling us, from experience, you do not need fancy navigation systems. They use 100% free apps only from Maps.me, Offline Maps and Navigation, Osman Maps and Navigation, and Mappy. Now, some of those are pretty generic terms, so they're kind of hard to find on Google. I've got all the links in the show notes page, so just for a Quick reference, you can jump on over there and see all the links that uh, we've put together on those free navigation apps. Sage advice from Lee. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. So, Lee and Steph, 
thank you. Seriously, we are so humbled that you took the time all the way from Australia. I think it was Western Australia. They were like 14 hours ahead of us. It was going into evening for us. It was going into past lunchtime for them the day ahead of us when we talked to them. It's wild. And they were on a little bit of a uh, home excursion. So, guys, thanks so much for taking your time and uh, speaking with us and giving everybody such great insight, knowledge, and a lot of fun stories from all of your travels and experiences. It's a good idea to visit the show notes page on our website at ghtoverland.com slash podcasts. Select the Grizzly and Bear episode. All the details and helpful links are already there for you. That is right. And send your questions, suggestions, and feedback to ghtoverlandpodcast at gmail.com. If you have an Amazon Echo, remember to tell Alexa, play the GHT Overland podcast. And we'd love it if you would connect with us on social media. At GHT Overland, be sure to share this episode with your friends who enjoy travel off the beaten path. Overland travel is all about meeting new friends, seeing the most amazing places on earth, and of course, new food and new drinks. If you enjoyed the episode, it would mean the world to us if you do two things to help out. Rate and review the podcast, that's one, and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Giving the GHT Overland podcast a little extra love on your podcast platform of choice. Oh yeah, baby. (laughs) Thank you, and we will see you next Thursday for a brand new episode of the GHT Overland podcast. Bye. Bye.